schedule. I might be in Borneo that day. <laughs> so we're glad that he's not here, uh, that he's not there, because we can have him here with us today. Um, I will also mention that he has a book that came out last year called, uh, I have it somewhere, Bottled and Sold, the story behind our obsession with bottled water. Highly recommended. Uh, and so without further ado, Peter Gleick. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's early for me, too, but that was a, a wonderful introductory talk. Um, we're going to move from reality TV to perhaps a little bit of reality science. Um, there is mud wrestling in climate science, I have to say, although, although so far there hasn't been any coconut oil um, or eating of insects or that kind of thing, but, but maybe, that, maybe that's coming. Um, to some degree, uh, climate science is today a contact sport. I would perhaps be the older geek, um, but this is a field filled with older geeks, so it maybe wouldn't be that, that unique. But I would also be the one boiling the water, because I know what's in that water, and, and I don't care how desperate you are. I know what parasites are like in the water around the world. Um, my field of training is actually climate science. I'm a climatologist by training and a hydrologist. Uh, I direct the Pacific Institute, which is in Oakland. I live in Berkeley, so it wasn't that far for me to come. Uh, the Institute's an independent nonprofit research institute. We work on global water issues. We do a lot of work and have for, for a couple of decades uh, worked on the implications of climate change for water resources. Um, and so uh, this is a, a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, what I would like to do is talk about, uh, the, the title in your program is Climate Change Misperception. What I'm really going to talk about is uh, not so much the science of climate change. I, I'm not going to tell you why climate change is happening, why it's because of human activity. I'm not going to too much get into the debate about climate science, but I'm going to talk more broadly about logical fallacies, about the nature of the debate about climate. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we argue about science in general uh, with specific reference to climate change. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about the role of science and policy because in my opinion, the debate about climate is not really a science debate. It's a science debate that's, it's a policy debate that's masquerading as a science debate. <clears throat> I do believe that good policy without good science uh, and without good analysis is, at best, unlikely uh, that we're not going to get good policy unless there is good science behind it. I think more strongly that we're certainly not going to get good policy with bad science. Uh, and we're seeing some of that happening now as well. Uh, there is also, as, as all of you in this room know better than perhaps most audiences I talk to, a long history of abuse and misuse of science in the policy arena. But, as I said, I do believe that the argument about climate change is really a policy debate hiding behind a scientific debate. Um, the really interesting and difficult questions about climate change are not science questions, but there, there are plenty of difficult, unresolved science questions in the climate area. But the really difficult issues, I think, are policy questions. If the science of climate change is real, if humans are changing the climate, what we do about that is a difficult, difficult policy question. But I think that's the debate that we ought to be having, rather than the debate that most of us hear. So I'm going to talk a little bit about logical fallacies. I'm going to talk a little bit about abuse of the scientific process. I'm going to talk about uncertainty and skepticism and public policy. I would argue, as most of you would probably argue, that scientists are, are by nature, or ought to be by nature, skeptics. That's the nature of science. It doesn't always work out that way. So let me start with some background on logical fallacies, which again, many of you are familiar with. Logical fallacies, very simply, are patterns of reasoning that are always, or at least often, wrong due to a flaw in the structure of the argument that re renders the argument invalid. That's the classical definition of a logical fallacy. There are many, many different kinds of logical fallacies. I'm going to talk about a subset of them um, 
uh, in particular in the context of climate change or some other scientific debates. And in particular, I'm going to talk about some of these. I'm going to talk about arguments from ignorance, arguments from error, arguments from misinterpretation, arguments from ideology, which are very common, that could be from personal belief or personal incredulity, I, something I just, I just can't believe that this could be true, uh, whether or not independent of what the science might say, arguments from tradition, um, arguments from consensus, which is a very important one, and I'll talk about that, uh, arguments from appeal to authority, and I'll touch on most of these. So arguments from ignorance. Um, many of you may have seen this. This is a, a classic Dilbert cartoon, and for those of you who may be able to not read it, Dilbert is out on his first date. Dilbert went out on a lot of first dates. Uh, and the woman he's with says, I collect crystals. And Dilbert's thinking to himself, uh-oh. Uh, I don't know of any scientific evidence that they can heal. And Dilbert says, phew. And then she says, but it's my point of view that they do. And Dilbert, instead of thinking to himself, says, when did ignorance become a point of view? <laughs> and you can tell from the look on her face this is going to be another one of Dilbert's first dates that, that doesn't turn into a second date. So this is an argument from ignorance. Lack of evidence, lack of information, either unwillingness to look at evidence and look for science, or inability to do so, but a strong opinion. It's my point of view that they do. That's an argument from ignorance. You get arguments from error, just making a mistake. And this is an old 1956 New Yorker magazine cartoon. And again, for those of you who can't read it in the back, it's a bunch of, in 1956, bearded male scientists <laughs> sitting around and they're staring at a blackboard with incredibly complicated stuff all over it. And one of them is saying to the other, say, I think I see where we went off. Isn't 8 times 7 56? <laughs> so scientists make mistakes. That's the nature of science. We make mistakes. And frankly, when we make mistakes, there's another scientist more than happy to point out our mistakes. That's the scientific process. Scientists make their reputation in part by pointing out mistakes that another scientist makes. But arguments from error are made. And that's a logical fallacy. Arguments from ideology. And again, the cartoon is a guy's looking through a microscope in a research lab, and he's saying, darn, you're right. They've all been contaminated by politics. <laughs> Arguments from ideology are very common. Uh, they're often rooted in religion. Sometimes they're rooted in, uh, rooted in politics. Uh, Galileo versus the church, that was an argument from ideology, or in this case, against ideology. Modern literalists, creationists, intelligent design, Lysenkoism, which set back Soviet biological sciences for decades, was an argument from ideology. Uh, and ideology doesn't make good science. Arguments from consensus. Uh, this is an important one uh, because it cuts both ways. An argument from consensus is the argument that something's right just because a large group believes it's right. Galileo was arguing against the consensus of the time, which was an ideological consensus. But everyone believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. Not everyone, but that was the common consensus of the time. And the argument that he was wrong simply because everybody else believed this other thing was an argument from consensus. Now, in the climate area, is climate change a very serious problem because the vast majority of climate scientists believe it is? That would be an argument from consensus. I believe that climate change is a big problem because all of my colleagues believe it is, or most of them do. No, that's backwards. In fact, the argument about climate change is not an argument from consensus. Climate change is a serious problem because the evidence has convinced the vast majority of scientists who work in this field that it's a problem. And it could still be wrong. The consensus is not what gives power to the conclusion. The science gives, leads to the consensus. So sometimes in the climate debate, 
We, the, there's a group of, a small group of people who still don't believe that climate change is a real problem or caused by humans. And they say, look, it's just because all of you guys believe it is, that's an argument from consensus. And I don't think that is. I think that's backwards. I think the consensus is the result of the science. And of course, there's a consensus about gravity. And there's a consensus about the fact that my cell phone will work when I turn it on. Uh, that's not an argument from consensus. And so the opposite of that is the argument against consensus. How do you argue against a consensus? And of course, the classic uh, enunciation of this is Carl Sagan, who said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. When there is a scientific consensus, arguing against it requires that you have good evidence. You have good scientific evidence, observational, theoretical uh, modeling that that is a requirement, and that's a requirement in science. And of course, Carl Sagan wasn't the first to say this. Laplace said, the weight of evidence for an extraordinary claim must be proportioned to its strangeness. When you have a strange claim arguing against consensus, you had better have weighted evidence. And he perhaps wasn't the first either. David Hume said, a wise man therefore proportions his belief to the evidence. So that's the other side of the argument for consensus or by consensus. Now, in that sense, you can't read this <laughs> intentionally. This is, a, as Jeannie would say, a terrible PowerPoint slide. <laughs> I show it because of the headline. The headline is, every scientific body of international standing accepts the findings of human-induced effects of climate. That climate is changing and that humans are largely responsible for the changes. And this is the American Chemical Society, the American Physical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the all of the geophysical, si uh, chemical, um, uh, geological, physical, meteorological, national academies of science of every country of the world all have put out statements so in support of the consensus that humans are changing the climate. And you can look all of them up, they're all online. But that's the nature of the, the consensus around the science of climate change. And I would repeat, we could all be wrong. Uh, that's, the, that's science. We could be wrong. And some scientist or some group of scientists that is able to marshal the evidence, observational, theoretical, modeling evidence that all comes up with a better explanation for what we see, for what we understand about physics and atmospheric dynamics, is going to be a very famous person. But we haven't found them yet. Another one, appeal to authority not competent to address the issue. <laughs> Can we appeal this to the Supreme Court, says George Bush. And this is actually, uh, was during the George Bush administration when the National Academy of Sciences came out with another one of their many repeated reports talking about the human effects of climate. Um, and of course, this was after he had just appealed to the, there had been this appeal to the Supreme Court about the 2000 election, which you may remember. <laughs> So, you want to appeal to authorities, but authorities that are competent to rule on the nature of the debate. That's an important part of avoiding a logical fallacy. So, there are lots of other logical fallacies, but there are also other categories of abuse of science. There is appeal to emotion. There are personal and ad hominem attacks. That's a very common one. And I'll come to some of those. Straw man arguments. Let's make sure we understand what we're really arguing. Misuse of facts or selective use of facts, and I'll come back to some examples of that. Misuse of uncertainty, and I'll come back to that as well. Inappropriate generalizations, falsification of evidence, suppression of evidence, and every now and then in the scientific world, papers are retracted because some scientist falsified evidence, and it, doesn't, it just doesn't take long for them to get found out. I don't understand what the motivation for this is, except desperation. Because scientists have to reproduce other people's evidence. And if you can't reproduce it, then you're in trouble. Manipulation of the scientific process, bullying of scientists. There are lots of ways that the scientific process can be abused. And whenever you're faced with a debate about science, you have to think to yourself, OK, is this an ad hominem attack? Is this an appeal to emotion? Is this an appeal to one of these logical fallacies when you evaluate what you're really being faced with? 
So let me talk about a couple of these. Ad hominem attacks uh, or appeals to emotion. Con uh, global warming is, quote, unproven at best and liberal claptrap at worst. Congressman Dana Rohrbacher, a particularly egregious anti-climate congressman from California. Um, liberal claptrap. Okay, it's an attempt to define climate as a left-right Democratic Republican liberal conservative issue when the science isn't or certainly shouldn't be. The policy debates may be, but let's separate those. Global warming is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Senator James Inhofe, another uh, very vociferous anti-climate person in the Senate. Um, Al Gore can't be trusted on climate change because he lives an energy-intensive lifestyle. Al Gore's been a real target. Uh, I'm glad I'm not Al Gore for a lot of reasons. Um, but he may live an energy-intensive lifestyle. In fact, he does live an energy-intensive lifestyle. But that's completely independent of what, whether or not what he says about the climate is right or wrong. That's an ad hominem attack, not an attack on the science. He may be hypocritical because of that, but that also is independent of the science. That's ad hominem. Scientists have ideologies. They are politicized, says Peggy Noonan in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Um, an attempt to discredit scientists. Scientists do have ideologies. We have opinions. We ought to be allowed to have opinions, but we ought to make sure that our policy opinions are separate from our science opinions and that when we express an opinion, a personal opinion, it's different from when we express our science. And that's important. <coughs> Suppression of information, selective choice of data, cherry picking. I'm going to spend a little more time with this because there's some really interesting examples. Uh, and if you understand them, it helps us think about arguments for or against any particular kind of science. So um, I was given an email uh, about a week or two ago from someone who has come to Skeptical in the past uh, about why they weren't coming this year. And they weren't coming this year because I was on the agenda. Um, and they were, it was a long email, there was some ad hominem stuff there, which I won't go into. Uh, but when you come right down to it, there was a little bit of a core of science in this email. And um, this person said, I'm so disappointed to see my local skeptical organization committing to the global warming issue prematurely. An objective review of the actual scientific data makes clear that CAGW, catastrophic anthropogenic global warming proponents have not made their case that CO2 has caused a meaningful portion of the mild warming seen 1900 and 1998, but since stopped as CO2 continues to grow. There's a lot there. I've highlighted a couple of words. First of all, inviting me doesn't commit anyone to anything. You guys have your own opinions. I, I don't even know if the organizations that that set this up have an opinion about climate change. My opinion doesn't reflect on them. So I appreciate the invitation. I was honored by the invitation. I've been a long time, I was an early subscriber to Skeptical Inquirer, but, but my opinions don't commit you guys to anything. On the global warming issue prematurely. It's been 30 years. <laughs> So it's not premature, in my opinion, but be that as it may. Uh, I highlighted CAGW because it's actually sort of important. CAGW stands for Catastrophic Anthropogenic Global Warming. Um, okay, so I, I don't know if it's going to be catastrophic. That, that's sort of an ad hominem label. It, it's labeling. Uh, I am an anthropogenic global warming proponent, not that I'm in favor of <laughs> anthropogenic global warming, but I believe the science that suggests that happening. The catastrophic thing is a, sort of a straw man argument. Uh, uh, so we'll leave that where it is. But then there's some science points here that are important to think about. Haven't made their case that CO2 has caused a meaningful portion of the mild warming seen from 1900 to 1998 that's since stopped. Okay, so. I don't know this person. There is a huge spectrum 
of debate about global warming from the deniers who simply say cl climate change isn't happening at all. Yes, it's happening, but humans aren't responsible because it's natural. Yes, it's happening and humans are responsible maybe for a tiny portion of it. Well, you know, there's a big spectrum here. This person is not saying there's no global warming. There has been mild warming since 1900. He's saying, yes, there's been some warming, but it's mild. Uh, CO2 hasn't caused a meaningful portion of it. He's not saying CO2 is not responsible. He's saying CO2 is not responsible for much of it. He's saying a couple of specific things. Global warming has stopped since 1998. It warmed to 98, but it has since stopped, but CO2 has continued to grow. So there are actually some things we could dig into here as skeptics. We could say, okay, let's look at the science of this. And so I'm going to look at some of the science of these things. In particular, two questions, and I'm really going to look at one of them in detail. The first, CO2 is not responsible for a meaningful portion of the warming, or the warming is natural. And two, warming stopped in 1998. Now, there's some numbers here. 18, 1, 29, 59. You don't know what those are, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you of a joke that most of you have heard. A, a guy walks into a bar. OK, you've all heard it. A, a guy walks into a bar, and there are a bunch of old guys sitting in the corner. And they're sitting around drinking, and they're not talking much. And every now and then, one of them says, 26. And they all laugh. And then there's silence for a few more minutes. And then another one says, 59. And they all laugh. And, and he, so he goes up to them and says, what, what's going on here? And he says, well, we've all been sitting in this bar for years. We all know each other. We all know our jokes. So a few years ago, we just numbered them. <laughs> and now, instead of telling the joke, we just go, 26. And everybody knows what joke it is, and, and we laugh. So, so that's the numbering story. Now, the, the joke continues. The, guy sits around, the new guy sits around, and he goes, 37, and nobody laughs. And he says, well, what was the problem? Isn't 37 a joke? And he says, yes, but you told it badly. <laughs> OK, but, but that's not relevant. But you might want to tell that joke to your friends. <laughs> the debate about climate change has been going on for so long, and the arguments against climate change have been repeated so many times, they've been given numbers. There is a website called Skeptical Science dot skeptical climate? Skeptical, I think it's actually skeptical science. Skepticalscience.org. It's a wonderful resource for those of you interested in the debate about climate where every one of the arguments against climate change has been laid out. The response with scientific evidence and links to the science and peer-reviewed papers is, is attached. There's a basic argument, there's a sophisticated argument. It's a really great resource. And they've all been given numbers. So CO2 is not responsible for a meaningful portion of warming, or the warming is mostly natural or entirely natural. That's number one, and number 18, and number 29, and 50, anyway. And there are 163 of these, or 167 of these now. Warming has stopped in 98. That's number nine. Literally, warming stopped in 1998. That's number nine. And, and 23, and not, so if you're interested, you can follow those up. The only thing I'm going to say about number one is that if there's any piece of the science we understand, it's the behavior of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the way they work radiatively. It, I'm not going to go into it in any more deal except, uh, detail, except to say that if we didn't understand this, heat-seeking missiles wouldn't work. <laughs> We understand thermodynamics of the atmosphere and the radiative properties of these gases. It's, it's beautiful, and the science is clear. I am going to talk about the second one a little more. So global warming stopped in 1998. That's a pretty specific statement. So you can look up the global temperature records, and I did. So this is the global surface temperature, land and ocean, corrected for all the problems with the global surface temperatures from 1997 to 2010, actually to 2008 here. It's the mean average global surface temperature. So 
It goes up and it goes down. The global average temperature goes up and it goes down. Temperature is variable. In fact, any one year of temperature is not climate, it's weather. There's a big distinction, actually, between weather, which is what happens day to day or single year averages, and climate, which is the long term average. But, so these are actually weather records we're looking at. But, so if you look at 98 and go to 2008, the trend is down. And 2008 was when this 1998 argument first really materialized. But this is cherry-picking data. This is classic cherry-picking of data on a lot of levels. So, for example, why not 97 to 2008? Or 99 to 2008? Okay, so the truth is 90 anything to 2000 anything is a subset of the data. So let's look a little more broadly. Oh, actually, before we do that, let's add the last two years of data, because 2009 and 2010 have occurred. Okay, so that's 2009 and 2010. So all of a sudden, 98 to 2010, 98 was a pretty warm year. It was actually, a, at the time, it was the hottest year on record, 98. And then for a couple of years, you know, temperature, global average temperatures had been a little bit lower. But 2010 is now the warmest year on record, or tied for the warmest year on record with 2005. Different temperature records vary very slightly, but they all show pretty much the same thing. But again, this decade, or 12-year period, is a subset. Why start with 98? This is the temperature record, global surface temperature record, from 1880 to 2010. And the little green line in the very top left, top right, that's the 12 year record that we were looking at a minute ago. So the decade, or the 12 years from 98 or 97 to 2010, is the warmest decade on record. So we're in a warming, accelerating warming period, but <laughs> that's me, isn't it? Okay. But why stop there? We have temperature records going back 2,000 years. We actually have temperature records going back 900,000 years based on paleoclimate records, but I'm not going to show all of them. But this is the paleoclimatic reconstruction from the year 200 to the year 2010, and the little blue lines at the far right. All right, so the blue line <laughs> is the instrumental record for the last probably quarter of a century. And you can see where we are. Not only is it the warmest decade uh, the, in a warming century, in a warming millennia, it's getting warm. And this is part of the reason why climate scientists are increasingly worried. So that's the issue of cherry picking. You have to be really aware, cherry picking is a very common thing in any science. You have to be really careful that the data that you're being presented are all of the data. And even this isn't all of the data. So surface warming, which is the data I've been showing you, is again only a piece of the puzzle it turns out that most of the additional heat that the planet is absorbing because of more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere isn't going to surface warming. It's going into the oceans. The vast majority of it's going into the oceans. So you don't just want to look at surface warming. Even if he had been right, you have to look at more than just surface warming. You have to look at other things. The, is there heat going into the oceans? A huge amount of heat's being absorbed by the oceans. A huge amount of heat turns out to be being absorbed by the ice caps and is being sublimated. It's, it's going to turn ice into water. So there are a lot of other pieces of this puzzle. So being skeptical requires looking at all the data. Climate change is more than warming. We've just experienced the hottest decade on record. Ice sheets and glaciers are losing mass at an accelerating rate. Permafrost is receding. Intense rainfall events are increasing. 
Sea level rise is accelerating. Oceans are building up heat, which I just mentioned. Birds and butterflies are migrating earlier. Flowers are blooming earlier, and plants in general are photosynthesizing longer. If it was just temperature, and if our temperature records were crappy, you'd still have to explain all of these other things. You'd have to come up with an alternative hypothesis that deals with the physics that we understand, that deals with all of the observations, that deals with modeling and computer analysis. That's what science is about. You have to come up with an alternative hypothesis that explains those things. And those people who argue against human-induced climate change have never done that. Okay, so that's the key to skepticism. It's not enough to question. Science requires that alternative hypotheses be offered that satisfy these additional factors. Okay, another cherry-picking example. This year, in January, uh, the president of the Heartland Institute, which is a group that initially was associated with the tobacco industry and now is associated with the climate denial industry, <laughs> said National Snow and Ice Data Center records show conclusively that in April 2009, Arctic sea ice extent had indeed returned to and surpassed 1989 levels. We're not losing ice, he's saying. The ice records aren't saying that climate's changing, but in fact, the ice is just as healthy as it's been for two decades. Now, a skeptic would dig into that claim, and there are ways to do that. This is a great statement. Okay, which data records? National Snow and Ice Data Center records. The National Snow and Ice Data Center is the preeminent national snow and ice data center. <laughs> um, it's, it's the right place to go for data would show conclusively that April 2009 sea ice extent has returned to and surpassed 89 levels. That's a pretty easy claim to check. Cl claim, easy claim to check, yes. So I did. I went to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, <laughs> got their data. These are the monthly data for 1989 in blue, and 2009 in red, January through December. <laughs> this is the data point. So just to remind you, April 2009 surpassed 1989. So not January, not February, not March, not May, June, July, August, September. So, First of all, these graphs show ice in the Arctic comes and goes. It, it shrinks in the summer, it grows in the winter, so that's the curve you see. But these are the two-year records. He had to look really, really hard <laughs> to find the month in 2009 when the ice extent was greater than it was in 1989. That's cherry picking. If this was your bank account, <laughs> You'd be pretty hard pressed to say that you had more money in 2009 yeah. than in 1989. But again, this isn't everything. So why just look at these two years? Why not look at all of the data that we have for Arctic ice extent? So this is from 1978 to 2010. Ice goes up and down, there's variability in this record, but you can see the trend. This is another reason why Arctic scientists are worried about climate change. In fact, climate change is gonna be much more extreme in the northern latitudes than in the central latitudes because of the dynamics of the planet, of the atmosphere. But again, Arctic ice extent is only one measure. Ice extent is the area of ice, the extent of ice. But it's not the best measure of the heating of the atmosphere. Because another factor is how thick that ice is. You could have ice of great extent and ice of exactly the same extent, but if one is a lot thinner than the other, you've lost volume. And that's a measure of heat absorption. So in fact, 
This is a graph for the same period. It's harder, a little harder to read, but 78 to 2010. In fact, I downloaded this last night. This is the most recent data from May 2nd through May 2nd of 2011, showing the Arctic ice vo volume. Again, showing the very dramatic decrease in ice volume. This is where a lot of the heat's going. It's not going into warming the atmosphere. It's going into melting ice. So another argument, and I forget which number it is on the skeptical, skeptical Science website, is the atmosphere is not warming as much as it should based on what we understand about how much heat should be being absorbed by these greenhouse gases. Well, it's going into the oceans, it's going into melting ice, it's going into not just warming the temperature. So these are examples of cherry picking. They're, they're subtle, they're difficult sometimes, but they're testable. Misuse of uncertainty. Should the, quote, should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate. That's a quote from a Frank Luntz memo to the, Glo to the GOP congressional candidates published in 2002. Make the uncertainty the issue, not the science. And for those of you who remember the tobacco debate, this is exactly what happened. Make the uncertainty the issue. If the public believes the science is settled, they're gonna move on to the policy questions. So let's make the uncertainty an issue. And Stephen Jay Gould said this best. In quote, in science, fact can only mean confirmed to such a degree that it would be perverse to withhold provisional assent. I suppose that apples might start to rise tomorrow, but the possibility does not merit equal time in physics classrooms. <laughs> so there's a debate about fact, theory, the definitions of those things. We can argue about those things. Um, is global warming a fact? Is climate change a fact? Or is it a theory? Yes, all of those things. But there comes a point when the contrary arguments do not merit equal time I would say either in, our, either in our classrooms or in our state capitals in Washington. And there was a letter in Science Magazine. I, only, I brought 40 copies of this, but for those of you, and I'll be happy to hand them out to those interested. Uh, there was a letter last May. It was the lead letter in Science Magazine from 255 members of the National Academy of Sciences uh, called Climate Change and the Integrity of Science, and it addresses this issue. Uh, how much time do I have? You have uh, about Five more minutes before questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read just one paragraph from this, but it's a great letter. You should take a look at it. There is compelling scientific evidence that our planet is about four and a half billion years old, the theory of the origin of the Earth, that our universe was born from a single event about 14 billion years ago, the Big Bang Theory and that today's organisms evolved from ones living in the past, the theory of evolution. Even as these are overwhelmingly accepted by the scientific community, fame still awaits anyone who could show these theories to be wrong. Climate change now falls into this category. There is compelling, comprehensive, and consistent objective evidence that humans are changing the climate in ways that threaten our societies and the ecosystems on which we depend. The scientific consensus could be wrong, and that there is a better explanation. That's what Galileo, Pasteur, Darwin, and Einstein did. But when some conclusions have been thoroughly and deeply tested, questioned, and examined, they gain the status of, quote, well-established theories, and are often spoken of as facts. So, a couple of quick comments about uncertainty. In 1986, the Surgeon General said, cigarette smoking is the chief single avoidable cause of death in our society and the most important public issue of our time. 1986, and this was frankly long after the science was clear to the scientists. So remember though, 1986. But then, in 1989, the Tobacco Industry of Institute of Hong Kong said, the view that smoking causes specific diseases remains an opinion or a judgment and not an established scientific fact. And in 1996, 
the tobacco industry, which still existed at that time, do they, do they still exist? I'm not sure. Quote, yeah. Oh, we don't believe it's ever been established that smoking is the cause of disease. And the CEO, Philip Morris, in 1996 testified, I think this was in front of Congress, I'm unclear in my own mind whether anyone dies of cigarette smoking diseases, cigarette smoking related diseases. Make uncertainty the debate and you can push off the policy questions for a long time. There are a whole series of issues about scientific policy misconduct, uh, packing of advisory boards, imposing litmus tests, suppression of information is a tactic that's used, bullying of scientists, and Galileo is a classic example. Uh, and there's some recent ones against climate scientists. I won't go into these. I love this one quote, though. Uh, it's from uh, Cardinal Bellarmine in the name of Pope Paul V in 15... I forget the year, 1570 or something like that. Galileo is, is ordered to, quote, relinquish altogether the said opinion, namely that the sun is the center of the universe and immovable and that the earth moves, nor henceforth to hold, teach, or defend it any way, either verbally in writing. Thou shalt not believe this. You know, you just can't rel relinquish the opinion. It's a, I just, I love it for its clear nature. So, moving forward, scientists and the public should resist attempts to misuse science and to intimidate scientists who produce results not consistent with an ideology. But the scientific community also has to be aware of internal problems and fix them. The scientific community has problems. There are problems with peer review. There are problems with falsification of data. There are plenty of problems, and scientists love to find other scientists who make mistakes and call them out. But it's always a battle. Real skepticism, in the classic sense, should be encouraged. Scientists and scientific organizations must be able and willing to speak out against false skepticism, not real skepticism, but false skepticism, and the abuse of science. Government and academic policies have to ensure the independence of science advising. We want our science advisors to be independent, to give advice based on science, not ideology. Funding needs to be transparent. I run a nonprofit research institute. All of our funders are listed on our website. Our 990s, which is our tax records, are public records on our website. Uh, our independent audits are publicly transparent because we believe in transparency. Scientific results, however, ought to be independent of funding. And I have to say, the argument that so-and-so funded science, therefore it's bad, is not always a good argument. ExxonMobil funded this science, so it's bad science. That's, that's not necessarily true. Funding ought to be transparent, but the results ought to be independent of the funding. And that's the key issue. And finally, the more we understand about logical fallacies, the better we're going to be able to argue logically, fairly, and productively, and move to what I think is the real debate, the debate about policy. Thank you very much. Yes. Continuing, should the scientists in global climate change, for instance, be participating in the policy debate, and how? Should scientists, specifically those in the climate debate, be participating in the policy debate? I believe very strongly the answer is yes, but I also believe that's a very personal decision. Um, some scientists are, are not good at that. Some don't like to do it. Uh, some work for organizations where it's not encouraged. Um, it, it varies. That's an in individual's point. I think if scientists don't get involved in the policy debate, you don't get good policy. I also believe very strongly that scientists should be clear when they're talking about science and when they're talking about opinion. Uh, making that distinction helps make sure that you separate science from from policy, but I also think scientists have opinions and they should be allowed to express them just to be clear the distinction between science and policy. So, so I think yes. Yes, in the back. Yes. Um, first of all, skeptical science is also an app on the iPhone. Um, yes, it does have a very good app. Yes. Um, 
God won't let our climate burn up. The other one is that if, if, if we're getting warmer, God is doing it, and we shouldn't do anything to stop it. And what are people doing? I mean, that is just like a batshit crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know what we can do to counter that kind of mindset. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, how do we counter the piece of the climate skeptic or climate denial debate, which is basically religious-based. Um, uh, either God won't let it happen, or it's God's will that it's happening. Um, there is some of that, and there's some of that in Congress. There have been some remarkable statements recently from some congressmen saying, climate change can't be real because God would never let it happen. I actually believe that's a pretty small part of the anti-climate debate. I don't know how to counter that one. That That's a... That's a true ideological debate. But the, the biggest part of the debate is an ideological debate that I actually think is rooted in, in fear of government. If climate change is real, if humans are causing it, then, and if it's a, this global big problem and it's associated with our energy system and burning of fossil fuels, it, it's going to be difficult to deal with. And it's going to require not individual action, but it's going to require some government intervention. It's going to potentially require somebody to spend money or maybe an increase in taxes or regulatory responses that's what i mean that's what i say that's what i mean when i say there's a difficult policy debate about what to do about it i think we're avoiding the policy debate because of some of those fears and i think we have to tackle that one head on yeah. um, my comment addresses what you just said earlier that the one of the problems that science has is a discipline we're all guilty of that uh, as good propagandists and good people at, at uh, Madison Avenue know, that people become convinced of arguments, not by the logical inference of their forebrain, but by the limited system of the brain, emotional arguments. So that's the, and we, we as scientists have not done a good, good job. Sit down and talk to us and we'll convince you. No, no, we're going to have to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> yes, that, that's a great point. The, the, the issue is sometimes it isn't really in the end, a scientific argument. It's an emotional argument. Uh, as a scientist, I understand that completely, but I don't actually know how to deal with it, to be fair. Um, I'm logical. I'm, I, I, when I f sit down at a conference next to a climate skeptic, what they call climate skeptics or a climate denier, I try to logically argue with them and present the science. And the truth is, it's not often. It's not really about the science. And I can't. Sometimes I can change minds one on one, but often it's not really about the science. And and that's a difficult question. And I don't want to get into a situation where I'm arguing from fear. Uh, I think climate change, if we don't deal with it, it's going to get worse and worse, and and in the long run, be really bad. I think we're screwing around with a dangerous thing here. Um, but it's going to be decades before really bad things are really obvious, although maybe not that long. But I don't want to argue from fear, so that's a, that's a hard one for me. Uh, this side, yeah. Another practical reason I don't want to argue from fear because the environmental movement's done it for 40 years. All these species are going to go extinct. People eventually get immune to this. They get immune to it. And when the really bad crap happens, it's necessarily going to affect them directly. So I think arguing with fear, you, you can cut your own knees off somewhere. Uh, it was just a comment that arguing from fear is not an effective thing. And I, I agree, but there is, just to get back to this, there is going to have to be some, there is emotional content here. Uh, there are emotional issues. There are serious risk issues. So that, that's, that's going to have to be dealt with. Sir. Uh, I first heard this debate in 95 between two people who absolutely believed that there was a problem. One was an economist, the other was a uh, physical scientist. The economist seemed to have totally lost any public visibility on this. Um, he yeah. argued that what we needed was not controlling the CO2, but um, ameliorated, you know, uh, getting getting away from the shore so when the sea grows. Uh, <laughs> uh, people laugh, but this is... Oh, okay, so uh, that's, that's a great point. 
Um, in my talk, I talked a little bit about this long spectrum from the people who just don't believe it's happening to the people who believe it's happening and are trying to figure out what to do about it, maybe. Um, yeah, on this side, sort of, yes, it's happening. Yes, human, humans are responsible for some fraction of it, maybe a big fraction of it. Is it going to be bad? Uh, is it going to be expensive to reduce greenhouse gases? That's the mitigation question. Um, versus is it going to be more expensive to have to pay for adaptation, not mitigate greenhouse gases, not fix our fossil fuel problem, but simply adapt to climate change over time? That's a science and a policy question. And the science component increasingly falls in the area of economics, which is how do we evaluate the cost of mitigation versus the cost, very difficult to measure costs of adaptation. What, what's the cost of, what's the value or price or cost of species extinction? What's the cost of simply moving away from the coasts and letting, letting coastal communities adapt? What are the costs of reducing greenhouse gases by getting rid of all fossil fuels quickly versus phasing them out over time? There are difficult economic questions and frankly the economists have not quite stepped up, in my opinion, to answering some of those questions yet. I, I agree with that. Sir. An argument from authority that's very interesting is the U.S. Navy. And I heard an interview on NPR a month ago with a very high-level official in the U.S. Navy, and they are absolutely planning for um, drastic changes in oceans and sea levels in the next 30, 50 years. Yes. And they, they have had their discussion and they've reached the conclusion. The argument is that the U.S. Navy has made a decision to consider climate change a real issue. It's an argument from authority in a sense. Um, uh, I've worked quite a bit uh, at the federal level with military and intelligence groups. Without a doubt, not just the Navy, but the military establishment and the intelligence establishment understands the risks of climate change. Their job is to evaluate threat. From a purely non-ideological point of view, their job is to protect the United States external threats. And they're willing, and they've been willing for a long time, to consider anything a threat if the science suggests it might be a problem and to work on evaluating it. The Navy especially, Arctic ice is disappearing. The Northwest Passage was open for the first time this decade, and it's been open twice this decade. And all of a sudden, the Canadians and the Russians are building ships to operate in the Arctic to look for minerals, and ironically fossil fuels, and, and to think about new passages and economic strategies in the, in the new open Arctic. Um, so there are real geopolitical issues that the military is looking at, and I think it's an example of, of yes, the acceptance of the science from a non-ideological point of view, just to try and understand what that's. Uh, we are be making this presentation available for downloading. <laughs> okay, I will put a PDF of my slides on the Pacific Institute's website. Um, so packings.org, where all of our publications are actually downloadable for free. Um, and I'll, I'll try and I'll figure out it will either be on the publications page or it'll be, it'll be easy to find. Yeah. Yes, so the, the issue is the argument that possibly this isn't true is countered by the argument that possibly it is true. And that's a good point. There's another piece to this, which is uh, evaluating the relative risk and how we feel about risk and how averse we are to different kinds of risk. Another argument, and I forget which number it is on the skeptical science page, <laughs> is that it's not going to be that bad. So, there are uncertainties associated with all of these things. I didn't show you the uncertainty bars, and this is, from a scientific point of view, bad, with the paleoclimate record, the temperature record for the last 2,000 years. There are uncertainty bars. And the farther back you go, the greater the uncertainty bars, because we're recreating the temperature records. But 
One of the arguments is, well, there's a possibility it's just not going to be that bad. The counter possibility is that it's going to be worse than, than we expect. And climate scientists typically talk about the best estimate, or the average, or the mean. Uh, and so when the climate, somebody says it's, you know, but look at your uncertainty here. It could be, might not be that bad, it might not be that expensive. There's the other side of that as well. The other argument about risk aversion, is my house going to burn down? I don't think so. The statistics are pretty unlikely. But I have fire insurance. Uh, I'm willing to spend money now to avoid a possible low probability but high consequence event or to insure myself against it. And I think that argument's a compelling one. Sorry, one more question. I'm sorry, you've been great. And there are a lot of questions that I'm not going to be able to get to them all. But I'm going to be here. I don't have to go to a ping pong party. <laughs> Okay, um, the sources are here. Paleoclimatic science is a very complicated science. The way we look at, you know, there were no temperature records past 100 or 150 years ago. So how do we know what the temperatures were? The whole field of paleoclimatic reconstructions is a fascinating one, and it's based on pollen records and tree rings and ice cores and a whole se and uh, sediment records in oceans and under lakes. There, there are really all sorts of remarkable tools for reconstructing temperature and precipitation records from ancient times. There are records going back, I said, 900,000 years now. We go to, I, we drill ice cores in Antarctica. Every year in Antarctica, it snows. And it doesn't melt. And so every year, there's a little bit of layer ice added to the ice record. And in certain parts of Antarctica, those layers go back 900,000 or a million years. And when we drill those cores, each layer has air bubbles. And in those air bubbles is ancient air <laughs> trapped in the year that it was laid down. And with uh, isotopic techniques, we can actually calculate the carbon dioxide concentrations and the temperature records based on the oxygen ratios. I mean, I could go on and on. There are lots of different tools. And there's uncertainty associated with each of them, and they vary. Some of them are available for some regions, others for other regions. But, but it's a wonderful field. It's an uncertain one. There, there, there's variability. That's why there ought to be error bars on this. This is, from a scientific point of view, I wouldn't, this is bad. There are error bars. Um, but, but that's the way they do it. Is this from one of them? Yeah, what, what, is there a method in particular for this one? This, was, this is a combination of paleoclimatic reconstructions using a variety of methods from a lot of different <coughs> regions, in this case around the northern hemisphere, which is the majority of the land area. Thank you very much.